There's no guarantee to free speech on misinformation or or hate speech, and especially around our democracy. Tim Walls is my dad. Kamala's my fun aunt. He buys you groceries and brings them over with a six pack and you have like a, a fun time together. Interesting here is not that we're talking about this. It's what we're not talking about. Kamala Harris still has zero policies published on her website. OK, Paul Graham, I'm so happy. Are you happy? Are you happy with Kamala running for president? It was like a MAGA hat in the bottom and a, and a coconut in the top right. And I was like, I got to get the fuck out of here. Super brave to like know that somebody that supports an unrealized capital gain tax would be like, okay, she can be in office, right? What's up, guys? Welcome back to the pod. We've got a packed one for you today. In a little bit, we're going to be talking to Ashley Rinsberg, who just published a piece for Pirate Wires called How the Regime Captured Wikipedia. I think there's this open question that we all have of what is going on over there. It just seems incredibly biased. I know that we've talked about it on this pod before. We've written about it before. I, I'm now having a flashback to Sanj and I discussing uh, specifically the was it the flag stuff on Wikipedia? Remember the yep. the, the flag that got all the all the immediate changes? That was fucking crazy. But there's a bigger problem I think with Wikimedia, which is the huge nonprofit above it. So we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, but first. I think we're actually going to open with poly market, the poly market betting markets this week, because it leads directly into this much bigger topic that we need, obviously need to discuss, which is the commodification of Silicon Valley, the broader conversation that's happening with her and also Tim Walls. And I mean, I, I just want to, I want to get into it. So here we go with Polly. So on Tuesday, obviously, Kamala Harris selected Minnesota Governor Tim Walls as a running mate. Walls is Midwest. This is the so what I've got here. Walls' Midwest appeal increased Harris's support by 7% in crucial swing states, Michigan and Wisconsin. Now that is an open question, and we can talk about it in a second. I'm not in, I'm not entirely sure if it was the Midwestern appeal that uh that bumped him up in Michigan. It could also be, I don't know, the really super, super, super anti-Israel uh Muslims who live in Michigan. It's like Michigan and Minnesota is where they're all concentrated. And she chose Walls over Shapiro, who we'll get into as well. Um, here it says he served in, in the IDF. I, I think this is, did he serve? Did he volunteer? It's not really clear. What's certain is Shapiro, who was the VP who everyone expected Kamala to pick. He is currently the governor of Pennsylvania, a swing state. He's very popular there, um, but he's also Jewish. And uh, that is not playing super well for Kamala's base at the moment. Immediately, there's a question of, uh, oh, is she anti-Semitic for not choosing him? Am I am I accusing her of anti-Semitic? I'm not. I don't think she's anti-Semitic. She's married to a Jewish guy. I think that her base is increasingly anti-Semitic. I think there's a very actual, it's totally fine to criticize Israel. And I think there's a way to do that without being anti-Semitic. I, I see a mix now on the, the very far left, just like I see it on the very far right. Um, but the important thing here is like this this choice on according to poly market i mean it's swunger in in michigan regardless maybe you'll say no 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 it wasn't it wasn't the uh it wasn't the anti israel uh muslims in the midwest it was the fact that everybody there loves tim walls's what his card hat or whatever the fuck it is and the flannel and they're like he hunts turkeys okay that like appeals to them um but the surge has improved kamala's overall chances of winning from 43% to 49%. Now, I think right off the bat, it's there's a question of how much of this bump is Walls, how much of it is Kamala, and how much of it is just the sheer determination of people online to be obsessed with this ticket, d despite all logic. And we've got a lot, we've got a lot here, and I want to set it up for you. I've got Sanjana in a moment, you're going to be sort of our Gen Z correspondent uh, <laughs> explaining what the youth are thinking about and uh, the bratification of the Kamala space online. Riley, we got to talk about the way that uh, <laughs> the Donald Trump administration is goading Kamala into doing an interview with a mainstream news outlet. But the poly market stuff here the the numbers that we're seeing on poly market now just the way that people are betting on this 
it leads me to believe that the vibes are really working. Um, so not even just that, man. I, I was watching a Kamala, one of her uh, appearances in front of the, the, she's been doing these con this concert series in various states where she brings out these musicians and then people come out to see the musicians and then she's also speaking and she sh in it she shushed one of the protesters who someone was heckling her she shushed them and she said you know if you don't let me finish trump's gonna win or whatever and he intends to end the affordable care act you know what if you want donald trump to win then say that otherwise i'm speaking It was a very simple statement and the crowd roared like just applause and uh, the girl there's I see this girl behind her shaking with excitement at, at this uh, like meme ready moment. And I just I guess I have a giant question mark. I don't know how much of this is real, how much of it is just bots online astroturfing the entire thing, how much of it is people responding to the astroturf. It's confusing. What I do know is that it's extensive. So following the selection of Waltz. We are just immersed in cheerful gloop online. It is people talking about the niceness of him. It is people talking about how he makes them feel happy. It is it is him him it is he himself. It is Walls introducing Kamala, I believe, at a at a rally where he talks. He thanks her for bringing joy back to the election. Now, <laughs> separate from that, you have uh, you have our boy Paul Graham saying, "Wouldn't it be nice if?" If every president, not even would it be nice, the thing that we need to be holding people up against henceforth, what we need from a politician, we need to know if he is willing to, not even willing, if he is able to sweetly read to kindergartners in a kindergarten class. And, you know, he's just espousing endlessly on, on Twitter about the importance of the niceness, the importance of the cheeriness, of the importance of the fact that this just makes him happy. Okay. Like this is really the important thing that we need to be talking about. We've seen, I mean, endless versions of this. One uh, increasingly popular one is just the sort of fictionalization of Waltz. And I'm getting to a point, trust me, just, just bear with me one more. Um, I do want to pull one of these up. So we've got we've got the people writing fan fiction. This one's from uh, <laughs> this one's from uh, Aaron Regenberg. No idea who he is. Got a blue check, bunch of followers. Um, all sorts of stuff, by the way. I mean, we've got 50 different tweets here. Some version of this, just, just describing who Walls is, who he is in relation to J.D. Vance. But this one really was the absolute best. Uh, <clears throat> Tim Walls is my dad. Kamala is my fun aunt who lives next door. They just found out I'm being bullied by the shittiest kid in class, J.D. When they try to talk to his dad, Don, it becomes clear he's the real problem. They go back to their car. Kamala pulls out her cop badge. Tim grabs his old baseball bat. They walk back to Don's porch. As Tim reaches for the doorbell, they look at each other and smile. This is going to be fun. Okay, we've seen endless tweets of this kind. There were more. There was one this morning that I read that was just describing Tim Walls as the kind of guy who cuts your grass. Uh, and JD Vance, I believe, is the kind of guy who maybe does it was it like he calls the cops on you for cutting your grass or something and then comments underneath that there was a guy who was like no 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 he doesn't just cut your grass he buys you groceries and brings them over with a six pack and you have like a a fun time together um now who cares about all of this right okay so people love him they think he's like a vibey old man they're they're wearing flannel or something now they why does it matter what what's interesting here is not that we're talking about this it's what we're not talking about kamala harris still has no zero zero policies published on her website okay this is a woman who does not have a platform which I'm being like, I feel like I keep t referencing this and people kind of give me an eye roll like Solana, like obviously we're beyond that. It's 2024. We don't do things like policies and platforms anymore. It's weird that she's not even lying about one. OK, it's weird that she's not even doing a moderate sort of like fake pivot to the center type thing. It's fucking weird. It's weird. Speaking of weird, which they keep saying weird, weird, weird. What's weird is that we're talking about the word weird. What's weird is that we're not we're not talking about the border or, um, I don't know, inflation, things that 
should matter in an election. Waltz is the other thing that we're not talking about. So the second you pick Waltz, who is the governor of Minnesota, which has voted for Democratic presidents for 50 years, since Reagan was the last time they voted for a Republican. And that was the election where everybody voted for a Republican. Everyone voted for Reagan. Nobody liked Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, I think once, was it one state that voted for Jimmy Carter? It was probably Massachusetts or something, okay? Maybe Vermont, it was something stupid. Um, but most people voted for Reagan that election. Minnesota, you, you, you didn't need Minnesota. What you needed was Pennsylvania, that's weird. So just begin there. The other thing that's weird that we're not talking about are any of his platform policies. So we've got him now on clips that are going super viral because we have nothing else to work with because these people are not talking about what they believe in today. Uh, but we have him on clips throughout the 2020. One of them is the free speech thing, right? Where he says free speech isn't guaranteed. I think we need to push back on this. There, there's no guarantee to free speech on misinformation or or hate speech and especially around our democracy. OK, hate speech misinformation. These things are not protected speech. Obviously, people are freaking out. It's, a, it's an authoritarian speaking. We can't, obviously, social media has been a problem with this stuff, but you can't legally ban people from this stuff. Then you have him uh, espousing support for rioters. You have his wife talking about how she opened the windows so she could smell the burning tires, sort of implying how important it was for her uh, in this moment. This is, again, this is the, the summer that rioting was legalized in America. Um, now you have the stolen valor stuff. So that's not really a policy position. And it's not something, I mean, it's something that I care about, I guess, morally. But um, what Kamala should care about is what it's going to mean electorally. So Tim Walz is being accused of basically lying about combat experience. And um, that's going to be a problem. But these are the things that we're not talking about. And this is why the entire, I guess, glupification of the discourse is so interesting to me. It's because you always expect some amount of this. but but it's sort of coursing and writhing through the substance, uh, even with Donald Trump, right? Like he is a tremendously cartoonish, clowny kind of guy who brings all sorts of bullshit with him wherever he goes, uh, insults and weird fake news that he either attacks or creates himself. Um, but there are policies there and there have been forever. In fact, they're the things that seem to really freak people out on the left. The first one of them all being build the wall. That's a policy position. You can attack it. Um, but you can't say it's not a position. <laughs> he said he was going to, not only was going to build it, he was going to make Mexico pay for it. That was on his site back then. And here we are today. And it's, it's still a thing that people talk about. It's still a thing that matters. Um, I do want to get into more of this, but first just rough cuts. Like how have you guys been experiencing the goop online? To be honest, I think that the clip of, of Kamala shushing the Palestine protester, I think kind of sums up the entire, um, Democrat response to the sort of the mach Democrat machine response to what their disgruntled supporters may or may not have to say about Kamala's coronation. I mean, I have to give the Palestine protesters a lot of credit for it. some of them are actually like sticking to their principles and saying, okay, no, we don't support this coronation. This woman is a continuation of Joe Biden. And this is an insane anti-democratic process that just happened and that we're all sort of expected to like... <laughs> <laughs> roll over and go along with um it does suck to be a communist in america like i mean I, they're annoying and they're everywhere and they affect the media but if you're an actual communist and you're in the, in the dnc like they do abuse you they do they abuse you. and and there's there's always been this kind of you know well if you don't fall in line and vote for whoever they selected i mean they did this, they did this in 2016 with bernie and hillary where you know debbie wasserman schultz and the dnc kind of colluded to to basically give, you know, Hillary the the nomination. And when people spoke out about it, it was like, well, how dare you not rally around Hillary? And, you know, you're trying to give the election to Trump. So they, you know, they always kind of um, pull this like, well, you know, if you don't rally behind whoever we've selected for you, you support the fall of democracy. Um, and to me, the it's almost like they're reveling in not giving a policy position, like they're reveling in the brat memes and the camo hats and all this bullshit that like their army of paid influencers, which I can talk about <laughs> in a bit, uh, if we want to get into that is, is pushing out and, you know, they're kind of rubbing in the faces of voters who actually want to know like, okay, what are Kamala's positions that they just are not going to, they don't have to give them right. Because Kamala clearly, um, I mean, she was anointed 
And, you know, they are now mobilizing the immense machine of democratic fundraising and access to media um, to, you know, make sure, I guess, as best they can, that she's coronated in November. Um, so on brand. You were talking about the pose that she gave um, at the speech when she was shushing the protesters. This is a really this is going to be a crazy reference and none of you are going to get it. No one, no one in this chat's going to get it. None of our readers are going to get it or none of our, none of our listeners are going to get it. My mom might get it. Um, I'm not sure if she's still watching. I did just watch what will probably be the last episode ever of the real housewives of New Jersey with um, the, any of the original people. Teresa is, is the last one um, for a lot of reasons that I won't get into. But what I do want to talk about is a lot of the tension of that show revolved around Teresa and her hatred of her sister-in-law who also hated her. And it's a really dark show. And I didn't even watch most of it because it's so dark. They hate each other that much and it's finally fallen apart. But the, in the last episode, they have this dinner where they just call each other like a whore and a bitch and a whatever. And they just, it's gloves off, no more pretending. Your husband with the boobs and you got the broad, honey. Oh my God. Cut it out. Cut it out, you're the queen of this You, you, Come on. You animal. They learn from the best white trash whore. And they both do this bizarre, like I'm a bitch pose. And they do it to each other. And Matt, I'm going to charge you with finding that pose and putting it up and then doing a side by side with Kamala because they're giving the exact same thing, man. They're giving reality television like me, like I'm a bad girl and I'm standing my ground. That's what they're giving. Um, I also, though, I want Sanja, I do want to hear about the paid influencers. First, I want to hear more about that pose. You brought that up. What about that do you think represents all of all of what's going on. I mean, I know you get, I get the coronation thing, but what is it about the pose? About about Kamala shushing the protester. Yeah, that moment. What is that? Oh, you're saying because she's, she's shushing the leftists, you're saying. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's that, but I also think it's kind of, you know, her whole part of her brand is this kind of, you know, Mamala. No <laughs> oh my God, no. The prosecutor, I right? Like there is, I think she's, she's playing into that, which is something that the Democrats, because they've always loved the idea of having, you know, like a smart, confident woman who can speak truth to Trump's lies and kind of, you know, shut down uh, what they what they think is is kind of like puerile whining and that kind of thing. Um, and and to me, like shushing, I mean, shushing is it's something you do to a kid, right? It's like it's very condescending um, sort of teacher like thing to do to a, a first grader. Um, and, you know, they I think they love it because that's kind of been their modus operandi in some ways for a while online with, you know, the way that they kind of cancel people. I mean, the right cancels people, too. But to her credit, what she said to the protester was. Stop talking or we're going to lose. And I think there's something to that. There's something to the fact that the far crazy left is very galvanizing for the right. It is very motivating. You want to go to the poll and vote those people as far away from office as you possibly can. So I think that in terms of substance, I mean, she doesn't have policies, but in terms of tactics, she's not wrong about that. And she does offer, I mean, this whole thing is, a, is an exercise in tactics. I mean, you just circumvented a primary to select somebody who you think has a better chance of winning after the guy who was running for president, actively running for president to the point where there was a debate between presidential candidate, between uh, the Republican and the Democrat. There was a debate. We forget that. We forget that Trump was almost killed. We forget that there was a whole ass fucking actual presidential debate. We forget that she circumvented a primary and she's now just running. Um, all of these things have been memory holds. She's just it's like she's always been running, I guess. Um so tactically, we you know we see these things in play, but you know it's it's less on the substance. On the tactics, I don't know that she's wrong. I think that she's she's sort of right. It is. I mean, I love to see a, 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 a an annoying protester shut down. Personally, always have, always will. <laughs> Bipart. I'm a bipartisan supporter of that. I really am. Um, but I would like to see even one policy proposal. Let's just start with one. Let's just start with one. Let's start with one about Israel. She wants to talk about it. She wants to shush the pro-Palestine people. The pro, I mean, are they, is it pro-Palestine at this point? Is it pro-Hamas? I mean, we've seen the pro-Hamas graffiti. 
We'll save that for another podcast. Um, I would like to see her talk about it, though. Uh, Sanj, before we get to that, if we get to that, I don't know what Brandon and Riley are thinking about the overall vibe, um, but this is part of that. Let's talk about the paid influencers. Let's talk about let's talk about the plaid. Let's talk about the hats. I want to talk about all of it. Yeah, I mean, well, so so Kamala chose Tim Waltz uh, to be her her running mate a um, couple days ago, and immediately after this, so so when she chose him to be her running mate, they posted Team Kamala posted this obviously staged video. Um, of Tim receiving the phone call where he's wearing, you know, uh, khaki pants and this camo hat, which is very important, uh, and like white sneakers. And, you know, he joyfully accepts the nomination. Um, and so this is immediately seized upon, apparently organically, I guess we're, we're meant to, <laughs> we're meant to imagine by, um, online influencers who are like, Oh my God, Tim Waltz is, camo hat looks like the camo hat sold by chapel rowan who's this uh like midwestern pop star basically um who sells camo hats as part of her merch and so they instantly sort of meme tim waltz and chapel rowan being midwestern princesses into existence overnight and instantly after this i mean i think it happened within hours um the kamala campaign puts out camo <laughs> waltz harris hats on their website the limited edition release at first um which they claim counterfactually is the most iconic political hat in america i mean of course the most iconic political hat in america just in terms of name brand recognition is the maga hat obviously oh my God. yeah never in history in never fact, in history having a hat feels reductive at this yeah. point. yeah just- yeah so they're doing they're trying to basically usurp the maga hat but um they release this and it instantly sells out. I think in like 30 minutes, 3000 of these, you know, spontaneously designed <laughs> hats sell out. Um, and then within, I think a day by the time team, team, teen Vogue publishes the scoop. Um, you know, obviously team Vogue has long, well, they recently pivoted to politics and I think they're probably getting info from Kamala HQ. Um, th- by the time they publish their piece on this, the campaign has sold a million dollars worth of hats. Um, and, you know, it, it's clear to me, I mean, the, the Kamala, the pivot to Kamala has been a boon for influencers. There's actually a pretty good piece in the otherwise unreadable wired on this, where they basically <laughs> talk about how certain influencers who post, you know, Democrat political content, their views have just skyrocketed since Kamala's um, n- was not got the nomination and uh so you have to kind of ask is this really an organic expression of like influencers are seeing these amazing you know memeable things in the the kamala campaign and deciding to make viral posts or what i tend to think obviously there is kind of communication between the the comms operators at the kamala campaign and some of these influencers and they're clearly I think, um, designing these, these, uh, PR campaigns. I mean, how could they have come up with these hats that quickly? I don't know. Um, so I will say that it's fun to talk about this stuff. I mean, the coconut thing, the brat thing, it's, it, it's definitely it's perfect for social media. And so I understand wanting to participate in the memes The I, I can see how that would be organic, but obviously it's not an organic political movement because there are no politics. How do you have a political movement that's not grounded in politics? What is what does it stand for? If you had to write, I, I would really love to actually read a piece from one of the mouthpieces of the state in say the New York Times op-ed section. Like like what in the way that there were endless, you know, anti whatever think pieces about what Donald Trump represented politically, there were politics there that they were talking about and grappling with. What would you talk about here? And the fact that you can't should matter. I mean, that's, that should at least be interesting. What does that mean? Um, you know, when you have otherwise intelligent people like Paul Graham not interrogating that question because he hates Donald Trump to the degree that he does, um, you know, to get to you to a point where you say, well, look at these, look at the VP reading before in front of kids. Isn't that great? You know who else was reading in front of famously, famously reading in front of other kids was George Bush famously. 
was out there talking to little kids when he learned about 9-11 and then kept reading to him uh, or kept what reading to them, right? Is that my, am I getting that meme right? In my mind, that it's that. What it, was so, yes. it was so long ago that that was the, that was the chain of events. Like, does that make George Bush a good president? Does that mean that, does that, is that, is that where we are right now? I mean, come on. I know that we're not, I know that we're not. Um, Brandon Riley, what do you guys make of the goop? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. It isn't just the paid influencers who are like going to defend uh, Kamala and uh, Waltz. Like you also have like Washington Post Kamala's Monica Hess, who delivered my favorite defense of oh, no. Waltz yet, <laughs> which was in respect to one of his other pretty out there proposals, the um, uh, proposal to put menstrual products in uh, classrooms of ages like four through 12th grade, I think, but also notably like the men's restrooms giving him the nickname that has since sprung up tampon tim um she says actually uh the people who are handing out period products when i was in high school they they were king of the, they were king stud she says <laughs> which yeah if if, you, if your defense is saying that like carrying around feminine hygiene products is riz like there's no there's no low that you won't stoop to to I defend the ticket i didn't understand this one because like when I was a 15 year old, 16 year old boy, I didn't, no girl was talking to me about her period ever. That was not a conversation. And I know there is this really weird subgenre of feminist writing online where they're very obsessed with their periods and they want to talk about them and they want to, it's, it's like a, I th but it's even among, even among leftist fe feminist women, that's not standard. That's like a very niche position. And I, I think maybe they would be into this, this idea of like men walking around with tampons to hand out to their female friends. But even if that were the case, even if we were all doing it, what woman would ever ask a man in class, not even a woman, we're talking about girl, 16, 17 year old girls, which one of them is going to ask a boy in class for a tampon? I mean, maybe I'm wrong here and they just, maybe I just am not, maybe I'm the sort of demeanor of a guy that is not a friendly, you know, I don't seem like the kind of guy who would give you a tampon. I would if I had one, by the way, and I would not be weird about it. But that's it seems like a weird thing to expect of a guy. It's and I certainly have weird. never heard of that. What was that, Brandon? I mean, it's obviously weird. <laughs> if I just I mean, just try it. I, I mean, any any guy that would go out in the street right now in New York City and ask <laughs> random women if they need tampons would be the creepiest thing <laughs> in the world. Like it's totally obvious that this is not real. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. That's all I have to say about that. It's just clearly not a real thing. You would be seen as a total creep if you're walking around asking women about if they need a feminine, if they need a pad. Because I, I have mean, I think that you should. <laughs> like, uh, Do you remember how much shit? What was uh, the one who destroyed Bud? What was her name again? The, she the, she oh, destroyed my life. Dylan Mulvaney. Dylan Mulvaney. Oh, Dylan Mulvaney. One of the greatest controversies of Dylan Mulvaney's time becoming a girl. <laughs> that was her series was like uh, X Days of Being a Girl or whatever. Um, <laughs> was when she said that she would carry around tampons in case a girl in the girl's room asked her for one. Now, Dylan Mulvaney, to her credit, I mean, I, I Dylan Mulvaney doesn't look like... I, I'm not... I, I understand that kind of... That I understand. I sort of understand that maybe, you know, and, and it's also, I mean, it's weirdly about her. It's weirdly her sort of wanting to be one of the girls, but that the performance of a girl, right? That's what's happening there, right? It's like girls carry tampons and they or share them with other girls. I think, isn't that, I don't know. I feel, I'm starting to feel uncomfortable talking about this. Sandra, should, please I, save should, me. I, should I give my female perspective? I yes. Mean, <laughs> I mean, well, first of all, I have a lot of thoughts on, on the tampon thing. Um, well, maybe I just have two thoughts on the tampon thing. The first thought is like, I don't actually see, I mean, ostensibly Monica was making a very weird argument, which is that this is somehow like the goal of this was to get boys to carry around pads and tamp, like, you know, males to carry around pads and tampons and give them, <laughs> there are a lot of funny tweets about, <laughs> you know, the situations where, where people would give them to, to women, um, which I guess 20 years ago would have been seen as really sexist because it'd be like, hey, you are you on the rag? Take a, oh, right. <laughs> take a tampon and calm down, um, <laughs> which is definitely how it's going to happen in high school. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
But the policy was intended for, you know, trans kids, basically. Uh, and, you know, whatever, what we can debate whether or not that category is real, but the, um, that was how, what it was intended for. And I always think like, if you're a trans boy, I guess, who's, who's trying to use the men's bathroom, wouldn't you not want them to put pads and tampons in there? Cause it kind of reminds all of the other boys who are in the bathroom, like, Oh, there's, you know, biological females in here. And like, th it's a reminder that, you know, you're, you're not a biological male. Um, so you know, we're of, making a, we're making a classic sort of mistake here, which is like trying to understand it rationally. I yeah. Think. We're breaking it apart and we're looking yeah. for a reason and there's no reason. It's just vibes. And so in a way it's perfect. All of it, maybe Walsh is the perfect guy for Kamala. Like it's all vibes. Like why would you put a, a tampon, disp a tampon dispenser in the male's restroom, right? Like that's vibes. That's not a rational decision. That's a yeah. vibes based decision. That's like you are you just you're just like ingesting left wing memes online, and you feel a kind of way, and you're like, fuck it, I'm I'm the I'm the governor. I'm giving the boys tampons. I'm doing it. I'm fucking doing it, <laughs> and you can't stop me. Um, which I don't know how Minnesota law works. I don't. Is he responsible for that? Can't, did he just unilaterally do it? Don't know. Don't care. It's not his policy because he doesn't have any new policies for the election. Um, I want to pivot a little bit, N not even a little bit. It's the same topic in, in this sort of. It's a re it's related to now it's venture. So the, the venture reaction to all of this, I did dip in briefly last night to the VCs for Kamala. A webinar um, like a Zoom chat thing they did and. Where do I begin with this? Um, <laughs> my God. So it, it opens up with the creator and she was just, you you could tell she was pleased with herself, okay? She was very happy to be there. This is the first time that anyone has heard this woman's name. And uh, I mean, she was just elated with what she had done, the sort of bigness of this, the historical nature of this. I think she might've used the word historical. Um, <laughs> she is, uh, she opens up with she talks about how so vcs for kamala really quickly is the group i think it was a two weeks ago now a week ago or so uh it was a sort of an open letter that was published to the internet with a bunch of people vcs who were supporting kamala is the long and the short of it you can discuss maybe why they were doing it what the motivation was you know was this a sort of we got to get back to the sort of bullying the right-wing people days of the past, this sort of new MAGA VC thing in which some a small handful, as we've reported, uh, VCs are willing to talk about their views online, whatever. They sign this open letter, they raise some money, they get a lot of press because the to the journalist's credit, the story of, you know, is is the magnification of Silicon Valley is an interesting story. Is it true? Is it not? You have all these people talking. I mean, I'm interested in it. What is the truth there? So this is now a part of it. We now have a webinar and uh, and she says she opens with, you know, she wants to thank everybody who signed that open letter, those 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 first few people, because it really took courage. You know, it was it was what was the exact let's get the exact fucking phrasing. Let's just pull it up and be journalists about it, folks. That's what I am. I am a reporter for Pirate Wires coming at you, not live, but <clears throat> It took a lot of bravery to sign this thing, she said, of the open letter supporting a Democrat for president in the technology industry. OK, when is the last time that the technology industry hasn't voted for a Democrat for president? It's f mind blowing that she turned this into a victim narrative. OK, like I don't I really don't know how it's possible. Uh, then you have. So that's her going off about whatever. Um, she's just excited to be here, excited to be in the venture conversation at all because she wasn't previously. But then she did get some big guys. Uh, one in particular, Ron Conway pops up and he says just very casually, like, I've known Kamala for many years. Um, we don't need to do due diligence on this candidate. Uh, this candidate is absolutely qualified. Again, this is a woman who, first of all, just circumvented a primary, so has not even gotten a vote, should not be there. OK, definitely not qualified to be there just in just in strictly democratic terms. Uh, but second, just in terms of uh, separate from her experience 
running whatever. I mean, she was the VP. Maybe that gives her some experience. She's a senator. I frankly don't think any senators, I don't think that should count as executive experience. America disagrees on both sides of the aisle. I don't care. But in terms of what she's going to do, right? Again, and I keep coming back to it because it's fucking important. She has no policies on her website. So this is a group that has said, if Kamala is not elected president, the industry could vanish. The industry could cease to exist. Let's just say that she had some pro. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there was some reason you believe. Maybe maybe Trump is has on his on his website. I'll have to go Google it in a second. Maybe he says, you know, I have a delete Silicon Valley platform position. Um, maybe maybe you could. I mean, it would still be crazy, right? But what policy of hers are you drawing from other than the ongoing existence of Lena Khan, who has tried at every F at every turn? to dismantle the tech industry, okay? Um, other than the very left wing of the party. So I just was looking at Paris Marx. Now he's not, you know, a Democrat. Um, he's in the Democratic Party, but he's not like a, he's not a Democratic operative or something, but he's talking about dismantling Silicon Valley openly on on X, okay? That's what you get from the far left. Uh, and then honestly, you know, move on from there, VCs for Kamala. It, it turned into, uh, there was one guy who did a like a pitch deck it was like a MAGA hat in the bottom and a, and a coconut in the top right. And I was like, I got to get the fuck out of here. And, and, and just as I was trying to exit, they started this panel of people. There was a, there was a woman who was, cr they, I don't want to make fun here because it seemed unstable, but she was crying over this um, in sobbing in tears about, about the, the hope that she felt with Kamala that led into the people talking about, there was one woman who said, if Kamala is not elected president, there will be fewer female entrepreneurs in this country. And again, it's like one, I don't know why like this is a weird thing to be talking about, right? I don't, I disagree with the premise there that, um, you know, women should be forced into starting companies if they don't want to. But more importantly too, like what makes you say that about Kamala? Where, just citation needed. Show me what she has said. Show me what she said. Show me the bad policy even. Show me the bad DEI policy that is gonna get you to that to that endpoint. What did she say? Where? What are the resources that she's planning to, to put this into? I'm not even sitting here saying it was it's wrong to do it. I just want you to, to prove to me that she said she's gonna do it. So the whole thing was crazy. Um, they raised, I think, $180,000. I will just say, I, I, I've, I, in my life, as a billionaire media mogul, I have met a few billionaires. And I know one in particular who's an investor who will pay more money than that to end an uncomfortable breakfast, okay? He will he will give that much money to someone to go away. And uh, I don't think that was a lot of money. And we'll see, what's, we'll see what happens moving forward, um, how powerful it'll be. But I would love your takes. Um, on this or, or anything we've been saying about the goop. I mean, did you any, have you guys followed the VCs for Kamala stuff at all? Or I've been I've been following, and I have a I have a contrary take. Okay, I, th I think they were they were absolutely brave to sign that letter for Kamala. <laughs> I think it's like it's super brave to like know that somebody that supports an unrealized capital gain tax under the Biden administration may be president that seems like a really courageous thing to do to be like okay she can be in office right because that'll just kill <laughs> the startup ecosystem you know, well, does she still support that though i mean yeah, i would give you that she, well she, so she was part of the administration that made that a pillar of their uh, go forward economic strategy um she also had a big hand i read in the um ai executive order which imposes totally arbitrary uh, limits on compute and es essentially would establish a regulatory moat for all but the biggest uh, AI companies in the space. Um, in the flip side of that, it would, it, it would hurt startups and um, which VCs are, you know, obviously that's a big deal for them. Um, I actually, I was looking for, so I was confused about her positions on business too. And I thought, because I was looking at some of those slides, Solana, that appeared online after the VC uh, VCs for Kamala oh, Zoom. Did the coconut slide make the rounds? <laughs> it, well, it's on Twitter. Yeah, there's there's a few. I on experienced Twitter. it live, but and I was like, okay, well, they they ha they must be referring to something because one of their one of the slides I saw is that like there's three reasons you should vote for Kamala. Um, one is that she's more stable than Trump. The the next is that she's normal, and that refers to the weird thing. And the third is that she would be good for startups. 
said, okay, well, there must be some logic to this. And I asked Grok and open a, a GPT and they could not give me an answer. I found one article in Forbes that was making the case for why Kamala was good for, good for business. And it's almost hilarious how, how, how much of a stretch they need to make on some of these items. Um, this is a list. It's like six or seven things, reasons. Why is she good for business? You can, you can find it, Matt. One of the reasons is that because, is, is because she consistently participated in small business Saturdays by visiting one and encouraging consumers to shop small. So basically like she went shopping on a weekend and made a PR, like made a, a you know, a sort of a PR campaign about it. Um, and the other ones that are listed is that she helped with the executive order about AI. She played a critical role in passing the COVID stimulus, which I don't think is a reason, right? So there's, there's really like nothing out there about Kamala's position except for potentially negative things, right? Like she's in the administration that wants to do right. the capital gains tax <laughs> it's, and wants to throttle it's, AI and uh, won't regulate crypto, which is completely throttling the startup scene in that sector. So, I mean, if you want to get if you really want to be serious about startup policy, um, you, you have to be very brave to sign something um, supporting a candidate that you have to default is like assume that is not good for business compared to Trump, who has put out statements and has a policy platform on his website saying that he's going to accelerate AI in the name of national defense. He's going to embrace Bitcoin. Um, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's sort of mystifying what the VCs are thinking. They have nothing to work with is the yep. problem. And you're right. It's it's the negatives even that we're drawing from here. I'm, and I'm reluctant to do it. I mean, I, I think it's true that she believes in all the negative things that she said to as a, as a left wing when she was running in 2020. So when she was running in 2020 just for the nomination before she was actively running for the presidency somehow um when she was running for the for the nomination for the dems she said all sorts of crazy shit and you could judge her for those crazy things that she said and obviously her administration that she was a part of i don't know how much you can really blame to her since the biden administration kept her like locked in a closet for the last 4 years and we just saw her when suddenly she was going to be our new president um so i don't i don't know that you can really blame her for what 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 biden did but yeah maybe that's something that you could grasp onto there's nothing in the positive not even fake things and that's her fault i mean people are dying to talk about her fake policies uh but they can't because she won't give them any. And so maybe that, you know, to bring it full circle, maybe that is what accounts for this cheerful gloop. Maybe that's where it's coming from. It's because there's nothing else. And you know what it really reminds me of to do another bizarre reference um, in this episode of them, I think, is do you remember when Chelsea Handler did that like commercial for her life where she was talking about how happy she was? <laughs> She was just talking about how happy she was to be yeah. single and childless. And she's, I guess, and I don't think it's, I'm not one of these like anti cat women people. I think that if you're single and childless at whatever age and you're happy, I think that's a definitely a possible thing to be. I think that there are people out there who are happy without kids. Um, I think it's very strange when you have to create a commercial for yourself telling the world how happy you are. When you're like, I'm so happy that I'm going to tell you how happy I am. And every few seconds, I'm really happy. I'm so happy. I'm doing drugs and math. And this is her, not me, talking about this. And I don't have kids and I'm happy, guys. I'm really happy. Aren't I? Don't I look so happy? Um, that's what I'm getting from the internet right now with the memes and the cheerfulness. And like, I'm so Paul Graham. I'm so happy. Are you happy? Are you happy with Kamala running for president? Um, are you happy that you didn't get to decide? Are you happy that she has no pro business? policies that you could possibly believe in? Are you happy that she's the person that you're running against the guy that you think is a dictator? Are you happy? I'm not convinced that you're happy. Um, I don't know. Are you guys convinced? Are you guys convinced that they're happy? It's cope. The Chelsea Handler thing is such a blast from the past. And I just want to say like, she got so much shit for that video. Um, but I think she really did deserve it because she was actually her framing of it was like, she was goading people who had kids on and being like, I don't have to wake up and bring my kids to school and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I do think, I think it's cope basically from, from the DNC left, uh, which again is not the entire left, but that 
they have to, they take anything. I mean, they literally, they, any candidate the party decides for them, they have to like feign this kind of sycophantic affection for, um, and then pretend to care about democracy. I mean, it's kind of a pathetic position to have to be in. <laughs> yeah, I think the happiness mostly stems from the fact that their nominee is no longer brain dead. Like, <laughs> that'll make you that'll make you pretty. Yeah, happy. <laughs> I guess there is some reason because you, yeah, you're right to give them some credit. They, they were not happy. <laughs> they were not happy a few weeks ago. <laughs> so the, the happiness is there. But it, it does feel so played up that I don't know, it's like, it's super, it gives Chelsea Handler. I mean, the whole thing is really online. And I, my hang up here is like, I don't know that they needed to go with an online forward, you know, sort of campaign strategy here because those people would have voted for Kamala anyways. Um, the Brat stuff, everybody who thinks Brat is awesome or whatever that meme is, like they would have voted for Kamala anyways. I'm more interested in what their electoral strategy is going to be with the actual people that they need, they need to bring into their coalition. I think there's some of this with Walls. Um, I think his camo thing and his Carhartt thing, um, I think this represents an evolution of the Democratic Party where they are, they notice that the intersectionality, the BLM, the anti-white stuff is just not working. And now they're basically allowing that white people who were turned off by intersection, by, by the constant intersectionality stuff, they're letting them back into the party and they're making them a part of the conversation. And so I think that is a good move in general, or it seems like a savvy move to me, but the brat stuff and the coconut stuff and the fan fiction, that's never going to get out of Twitter, I think. And I don't know how much that actually matters in terms of the outcome of the, of, uh, of the election in November. Well, we'll see. I'm sure by next week, at the pace of uh, information evolution, we will have a new vice president, uh, a, new, a new vice presidential candidate at this rate. Um, I'll tell you what does make me happy is this Wikipedia piece that we just published in Pirate Wires. Now it is my great uh, pleasure, honor to introduce Ashley Rinsberg, who just wrote a great, great piece for us at Pirate Wires, How the Regime Captured Wikipedia. Uh, this is a piece that we've wanted to do for, oh, we wanted something like this at Pirate Wires for a while. This is a topic that comes up just again and again and again, um, is the question of Wikipedia, how it's edited, what is going on over there, is there bias? Um, Ashley has done you know a bunch of poking around over there, and I think has a, probably a few stories in him uh, when it comes to the topic of Wikipedia kind of coming up. But as he started this one, um, he sort of started pulling the threads and, um, and entered a story that I think is just really, really fascinating, uh, really important, absolutely blew up online. You know, Larry Sanger, the co-founder of Wikipedia, retweeted it, said it was a must read. Elon, you know, giving it a shout out. I do think that we have here sort of like the canonical story of what happened to Wikipedia over the last five years. And uh, I think it's just, yeah, a great, important story. Ashley, welcome to the show. Um, welcome you. to the Pirate Wire sort of extended universe. Um, take us through it. T take us take us through what you found. Yeah, the, I think the the thing about Wikipedia, what we're seeing, people, people are talking about bias. And I think that's pretty established. David Rosado is a colleague of mine, did a study, computational analysis of Wikipedia bias and shows it's pretty clear cut if you look at it against politics um, and ideological expression. But, you know, always when it comes to these big institutions, and that's what we really need to understand Wikipedia and more importantly, Wikimedia Foundation, which owns Wikipedia as they are massive institutions and hugely important in everything we do today. It's not like any other NGO. So in that framework and in that context, trying to understand all this talk about money, you know, we, we started to kind of bubble up conversations about people not wanting to donate to Wikipedia because they have hundreds of millions of dollars in assets um, and revenue. And that kind of thing, you know, I, I think it rings, it, it raises an alarm at some level. And we saw that happen online. So trying to understand the story where this money came from is, is what really led us 
down this rabbit hole of Wikimedia Foundation's alliance with a very, very high profile a progressive NGO, social justice NGO called Tides, Tides Center, which runs the Tides Foundation in addition to other funds. And they had sort of stitched themselves together around 2017, where we see this big shift at Wikipedia, definitely towards something that is more ideological. I think in their eyes, it's about equity and it's about justice. But, you know, if, if we take that as something apart from Wikipedia's original founding mission and its current operating principles. So that's kind of in the big picture of what the story is about. Um, we're happy to discuss more of the detail. I think why don't we start just what this comes up again and again and again is this concept of Wikipedia's uh, founding mission. How would you describe that to someone just peeking in, I would say, for the first time? Wikipedia is something that we all use. We don't think much about. We know it's sort of community edited. I don't think the average person knows much more beyond that. So what was that mission? What was uh, the stew in which the sort of internet cultural stew in which Wikipedia emerged? And then from there, I think we can talk a little bit more about what happened. Yeah, that's a great, great question because Wikipedia has this really fabled storied origin of, you know, a mission of open contribution to an encyclopedia that would one day contain all the world's knowledge or, you know, an effectively, an effective dose of it. So the mission was about being open. It was about no one having control over the, the content, over the policies that it would all be determined by the community who are adhering to this kind of structure that was built into early Wikipedia. And it's really quite amazing because it, it's by and large, it does function that way today. However, what, what we saw in 2016, 17 with this pivot is that Wikimedia Foundation, the NGO that owns the site, it, the one that basically holds all the assets and all of the money, started to uh, set a direction, strategic direction for Wikipedia that is really divergent from that original mission. This is really about what they call uh, knowledge equity, and that's about intervening. So Wikipedia is kind of always been this receptacle of knowledge. They don't create new information on the site. They use other sources to corroborate statements or facts that get onto the site. And it's never something that they're actively doing ex except for editing Wikipedia itself. Well, let's, can we talk about knowledge, knowledge equity? As I was reading through your piece for the first time was the phrase that jumped out at me. I'm always really interested to learn about new dystopian phrases. Um, break that one down for me. What is knowledge equity? And then I, maybe we just pause and talk about knowledge equity for sure. a second because I have some thoughts. Well, I think for Wikipedia in that context, you know, they had a big problem that they recognized really early on, which is that at some point, it was up to 90% of the editors on English Wikipedia were male. And it's probably similar across other languages. And even today, that's like at best 80%, 20% are women and 80% are men. And but you, you said you, they recognized they had a problem with that or yes, they, they felt they had a problem or internally. Which, so do you? Okay. Yeah. So they, they started to address it around 2010, maybe even earlier. But really, this is about if you're saying this is all the world's knowledge in this encyclopedia, but it's written mostly by men. And we've learned a lot about from from the equity uh, discourse about the value of a perspective, the gaze, whose gaze is it? In that case, Wikipedia would be the male gaze in this reading, right? So that's a big problem. The male gaze the, of history, uh, the, uh, the male gaze as it relates yeah. to history. His, yeah, history and everything else. And, you know, again, if okay. you before we, I think, I guess I, f I fail to, uh, are we going to sit here? Uh, maybe, are we going to be debating the merits of this or is it worth it? Are we on the same page or, or is anyone able to steel man this? Cause I really, for me, the concept of this is already pretty offensive. The idea that, um, I don't know, uh, women and men, like you need some sort of like equal number of voices to do some sort of task. I, I think that it automatically invites some kind of sexism into the conversation, not just against men, which is the sort of obvious reading of the sexism, but against women. The idea that women are mm -hmm. going to have some very specific gender-based reading on something like, I don't know, 
the reign of Louis, whoever the fuck in France or something, you know, what is it about having XX chromosomes? And I know it's a complicated discussion as per last week and our talk on the Olympics. What is it about that that is going to influence the way that you write on a post? I, I sort of do, I, if I were to give them a little bit of credit here, I kind of, I would understand maybe why it would be important to include women in a conversation on women's health or something like that at the policy level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, you should be speaking to women about this. Um, I don't understand how this affects the global knowledge base or something. That's a really crazy concept to me. And it's a crazy concept that was really normalized really quickly that I, uh, you know, we never really had a chance to talk about as a, as a culture. We never, we never came to agreement on, on this concept that women are going to have a fundamentally different perspective on history than men. You know, even as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that I've internalized their language to a certain extent. I've internalized their arguments to a certain extent. I reflexively feel like, oh my God, we do, I, I better be careful with this topic or something. But it's crazy. What they're saying is new, not crazy, let's say. It's definitely new. And um, I don't know. What do you, Sanjay, what do you make of this? Um, I mean, I find it condescending. I think it's, it's, you know, not to usurp your place, Ashley, but I, I think it's interesting. To me, it makes sense that most of the, the Wikipedia editors would be male because it seems like a, um, a job. I mean, it's unpaid, but this kind of, you know, somewhat nerdy community of people who are very, uh, interested in maybe nitpicking the facts of different niche historical events and definitions mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Not to say that there's not tons of women who are interested in that, but it just kind of seems like an online milieu that would skew male. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think a kind of top down attempt to correct that. <laughs> it just feels like, I don't know, some weird form of like affirmative action for women, um, which I've always found a little bit, you know, condescending and unfortunate. Yeah. And it, it's kind of what led into this, the scandal that the, the piece kicks off with this scandal where a, an administrator was banned for a so-called harassment, but there was no evidence or examples of the harassment provided. It was just kind of a vague, you've been banned. And, um, the, the other editor that he was accused of harassing, of course, was a woman, um, who was in a romantic, who was married to one of the most senior people at Wiki Media Foundation, uh, a woman named Maria Sefidaris. And, this is the chair. We've had a lot, by the way, there's been a trend on pirate wires recently of sort of evil lesbian couples. I don't know if that's rude to point <laughs> out, but I think it's interesting. <laughs> I think that, I think lesbians, I think evil lesbians are having a moment and I'm here for it, frankly, as someone who loves a good story and loves like a different cast of villains. We haven't seen evil lesbians in a while. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, the, I'm sure that it, it, they had good intentions and they have good intentions, but they always you know, do. They, there was a, I mean. there, was, there was clearly a moment there at Wikipedia, um, where things boiled over with this ban because it just, because it was handed down by the foundation and it didn't come from the community itself. The community itself has mechanisms to do this kind of thing. They have an arbitration committee that would normally do it in every other situation. But in this case, and this is lining up with the timing where they're kind of flipping over to the Tides Foundation, where things are becoming more top down. One of the very few isolated cases where, they, where the foundation itself hands down a ban and uh, that set the community alight. And, you know, this is where we're seeing the diver divergence between the community and the foundation. Well, yeah, because the, com the foundation is centralized, the community is decentralized. And if the centralized entity has control over the, decentral the decentralized encyclopedia, then it's no longer decentralized. Clearly, it has authority over what's being edited and how. And you have a lot of great details in the piece about that. There was one piece that, I mean, as I was reading it for the first time, I didn't quite know where you were going to take this. And you and Brandon did a lot of I think great back and forth on this, by the way. I want to get Brandon his props as well. Um, so I, I went into it with fresh eyes. It was a sort of a, it was a different thing when we, when we mm -hmm. first started, uh, I didn't realize when you actually built to the Catherine mayor, I didn't, I, I think I, I like knew that Catherine, you know, was at, at Wikimedia. I just forgot. It wasn't, a, it wasn't on my radar. Now, Catherine mayor, you'll probably remember folks from uh, NPR. So she's the new, what is she? This does NPR have a CEO? What is their yeah. structure yeah. over there? She's, she's the, the CEO. CEO. She's the CEO of, 
of NPR. Um, it was a huge scandal when she was announced because all of these tweets of hers were on earth. They're of course, incredibly biased, incredibly. And when we say biased too, it's not just, oh, she's voting for Kamala Harris. Okay. Nobody cares about that. It's like, we're talking about extremely left wing, all drank all of the Kool-Aid throughout 2020, you know, is, is, has gone down all of the patriarchy subreddits, uh, and she is out there talking about things like, for example, knowledge equity. I had no idea that it seems to me, based on your reporting, that she really started the entire evolution of Wikipedia. It was her. Yeah, that was very much under her leadership. And I don't know that she's drinking the Kool-Aid so much as making it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, she had, you know, she was the New York Post did the story about her saying that Wikipedia, the open ethos was something she opposed because it was like a vestige of white male colonialism. That was what it was. Yes, 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 yes. The, that that it, there was something inherently male about the concept of openness. Yes, exactly. It, it, it leads to like domination by men, which is what exactly what we were just talking about at, at Wikipedia, 80%. You know, the, the explanation could easily be that like men just like doing it more than women and women just don't like doing it as much. It's just, it's a different thing. It's a specific thing in the world. That's okay. But they've always, they take it as a, as something that is product of and cause of injustice. You know, this, this stuff, this is really a long, it, it was a long, the most virulent form of the kind of gendered everything discussion that we've been having really has been ongoing for since 2017, which I, I think is uh, the beginning really of all it, all of this stuff. Um, stuff that was brewing long before that, but 2017 mm -hmm. is when it all came to a head. I think it's when you had these yeah. battles in boardrooms across the country. It's where the virulent new strain of leftism won, I would say almost everywhere. I, I don't really know anywhere um, that it didn't succeed. I mean, obviously there were niche, like little, mm -hmm. there might be some VC firms or some shops or whatever that weren't extremely woke, but in all of the huge companies, all of the, uh, everything in academia, like everything bureaucratic, every institution became media, hyper, 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 hyper. The media, the media hi, not just hey. left wing, but left wing in this specific way, when they've adapted a really radical frame for looking at the entire world. It's this like radical oppression lens. It's when suddenly we need, you know, equity, not equality. So the, the hammering down of everybody um, to get to the same sort of place. But it, what it reminds me a little bit of, because I, I was just about to say, you know, why do they never care about something like, 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 for example, you know, I play a lot of Magic the Gathering and there aren't many women who do, right? When you go to a draft or something, it's, it's guys who are playing magic. I don't even know that I've played with a woman. I'm sure there, I know there are women who play, you know, you see the, at the conference and things. I, I think I personally, when I go to a comic store to do a draft, I don't think I've played with a woman before. Um, it's all just like very, very nerdy men mm -hmm. um and d different kinds of nerds you've got like your you got like your gay nerds you've got like your gym like bro nerds um mm -hmm. you have your classically presenting revenge of the nerds nerds they're all there but they're they're male they're different kinds of nerdy guys uh yeah. and then i remember gamergate and i remember just video game the sort of video game reckoning in general gaming was super super male dominated as well and you would say you'd think like who gives a fuck if mostly guys are playing these first person shooters or whatever it is like who cares people actually cared there were a bunch of people who were like we need to change this we need more women playing video games so i can't even say necessarily because my impulse is to say we only really care when it's a super high status thing um but it's not necessarily there. There are these weirdly low status things that people care about. Uh, for example, video games. I mean, they still haven't come for magic, but I guess it's only a matter of time. <laughs> they, they definitely came for D and D. Yeah, there, there was some of that, but w what was the D and D controversy again? Wasn't that more about who was creating it than who was playing no, it? No, It was like different races ha had slaves uh, of other races and that wasn't okay. And just, I don't know, different races were coded as black according to feminists or something. And they had to erase that. It was <laughs> the nerds have, the nerds are trapped in the longhouse, man. Dude, at, at this point, <laughs> I remember the first time I was in a bar, I was in a gay bar in Williamsburg in 2010. And this is before. So if 2017 is the high mark for all this fucking craziness, 20, I would say, I don't think I really encountered it online. I, I encountered it early. 
via Thought Catalog where Brandon was working in the comments section is when I first started hearing really crazy shit. Like, for example, the phrase systemic white supremacy, which now we all know what that means. At the time in 2011, when I first read that, it was like, hmm. what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> systemic white supremacy. White supremacy is the KKK. That's not America. That's a really, really, in that's a crazy person's view of what's going on in America. Um, but that was like 2011. So I would say 2010, before I even encountered that, I was in this bar and someone said Lord of the Rings was racist. And I was with my most left-wing friend that I had, uh, overwhelmingly like sort of a crazy left-wing person, but she also is a nerd and she loves Lord of the Rings. And that was her, she she said, no, not today. No, 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 no. That's just, that's some crazy shit. We're not, we're not accepting that. And they got into it there. And then we talked about it later and we both like, confirm to each other it's not racist right like how is lord of the rings racist that's so strange it's i don't see it um and now if someone says lord of the rings is racist you might disagree but you you right. can't say that you don't know where they're coming from you know you know exactly what they're what they're referencing the sort of strange new philosophy political philosophy that they're tapping into and um it's just funny how how quickly culture has changed, not only changed, but really seeped into these ins institutions, like you said. Um, the Catherine Mayer piece of it all is is just really wild. So she launches this, this initiative. It, it sort of moves forward through the institution. It takes out one of these editors. It affects, I think, the coverage, the Wikipedia, what, what is going on there to a certain extent. One standing question I have for you, Ashley, before I let you go is just what what is the what is the relationship at this point between Wikimedia, the nonprofit entity that is this, that you were sort of reporting on, and Wikipedia? Uh, how much, how much control do you think they have? How much control do you think they exert? Uh, and what is this sort of danger for the platform moving forward? I think the the danger, just kind of answering backwards, reverse, is that Wikipedia becomes, you know, the, the most outside farthest um, danger would be that it becomes a tool for this top down mass, lo mass level censorship we've been seeing arising over the last five years through COVID um, that Wikipedia has used as a tool to sort of control narratives and, and silence people that, that um, stray from the official narrative. That would be the worst danger that, that, that this is heading towards that because it, so much of the language coming out of the, the movement strategy, the 2030 strategy is about knowledge equity, but it's also about, um, the global information war that we're in. I mean, they, they know it. So, and that's how they see it. They see it as a war of information. And they can be a positive force, but that positive force might mean that they get on what they believe is the right side, which we've just been talking about that for the last uh, half an hour. So I think that's, that's the danger. What is the relationship right now? I think there's probably grumbling within the community that, you know, I, I, I would need to dive into that further, but the whole Fram thing, the ban on the male editor, it's still kind of it's still kind of a rotting wound there. It, it didn't just go away. Like the it was also weird. It was also strange. And Fram was still an, and just, he is today one of the best editors on the site. So you know I think it's going to be more and more fraught. But with that kind of money that they're pulling in, I mean we're talking about the the endowment that was set up within the Tides Foundation it's at around 120 million dollars wow. now though Brandon I I've also seen 140 um NPR actually reported 140 by January of this year so that's a huge amount of money separate from the foundation Wikimedia Foundation's own holdings at something like 250 million dollars so at some point when you're dealing with a billion dollar you know projecting out a few years we're going to they're going to get to a billion dollars in assets and that amount of money and that amount of power will crush a community. We know that. So that's my fear. And that's where I think this all gets very difficult. Do you have a sense of how, I mean, what is the clear and present danger, I guess? What is the, um, what is going on right now? I mean, the, the Graham thing was pretty bad. I think that they're charging up sort of, or they're 
tapping of people to sort of gather information top down was pretty bad. How much of that is going on today or, or do, is it still a sort of open question? I think it's an open question. I mean, for sure, what we know they're doing is they're, they're funneling money into other NGOs, smaller NGOs. So they're, they're kind of becoming a pass through or a grant maker and funding a lot of these very, um, some of them radical, some of them extreme left, some of them, you know, progressive NGOs that are out there doing actual activism on the ground. And, and some of those are feeding into other smaller NGOs. There's this crazy, like this whole food chain. But they're p passing through a, a lot, a lot of money to activism. And, you know, my guess, and this is what I think remains to be investigated, is that there is still some kind of pressure mechanism. Um, there's the way funds are used on the site. There's decision making about policy that has to be done. So there's always going to be some influence. I, I think the question is just how much it is right now. Awesome. Well, great job on the piece. Uh, I encourage everyone to check it out on Pirate Wires. It's up there right now. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, let's see if I can set this one up for you guys. So there are a lot of, we don't like to cover, we try not to cover Europe too much, but it's the summer and there's a lot going on in Europe for Americans right now. Um, and I have kind of this, it's I'm giving, it's like Emily in Paris kind of energy, like this, this American girl abroad, just, just like living in her idyllic universe, uh, the sort of fake Disney world version of what France is. Um, and I realized today as I was reading the headlines about the Taylor Swift concert that was canceled because of Islamic terrorism, um, that like perhaps there's a disconnect between the American expectations of Europe and the reality. Uh, one other version of this. Now, I'm not here to trash France. You know that Pirate Wires has a weird thing for Paris and France. Um, it is now canon. It's just unfortunate. We're maybe going to be a little bit contrarian about this. We're big France de defenders here, or at least I am. And I know Sanjana is. Uh, Brandon, Riley, not sure you guys land on France. I'm rooting for them personally. But the fact that their politicians forced the Olympics to make swimmers at the peak of their health swim through, is it it's the River Seine, right? Is, yeah. Am I pronouncing that right, Sanjana? Yeah. Swim through the Seine, and one of them got a coli. His fucking bananas. So that's. It's, it's not clear it's E. coli, but she was hospitalized. There's a, several swimmers, several several triathlon swimmers, who are forced to swim in the Seine, which is you know historically been a cesspit, like an actual cesspit of just sewage, um, have been hospitalized with bacterial infections. Do you want to break down? So I, I want to, um, let's just talk about the react. We, we have, it's like, it's a, it's a summer in Europe, uh, possibly a thing for you, depending on, uh, I don't know, whatever your circumstances are. Certainly it's in the culture. Um, I want to start with, with the Olympics and then I want to move into Islamic terrorism. So, um, beginning with the Olympics, Sanjana, uh, do you want to just like, I mean, how much do you know about, the river it seems weird like it seems like there's some weird other thing going on there that has nothing to do with the olympics what is what is that well i mean this has been an ongoing kind of controversy with the paris olympics the paris olympics for those who have been following has been a kind of logistical shit show <laughs> from the like offensive bizarre opening ceremony to now um but you know one of the kind of um hallmark programs for for Paris politicians who were hosting the Olympics was that they were going to clean the Seine because they really wanted triathlon uh, athletes to swim in the River Seine. Bizarre. I mean, you know, London hosted in 2012. No one swam in the Thames, which is just like polluted as well. They swam in a, ri a little river like in a random suburb of London. Um, but for some reason, Paris was fixated on <laughs> swimmers swimming in the Thames, uh, sorry, in the Seine. And um, so they poured a remarkable amount of money in this, like hundreds of millions of euros at the least, in this cleaning campaign um, where they said they were going <laughs> to disinfect the Seine. And um, as part of this, at the end, the, the mayor of Paris um, swam in the Seine and sort of, you know, had a big photo op where she said, you know, it's clean. And she talked about, you know, how how lovely it was. Um, this was then followed by like angry Parisians threatening to defecate in the Seine. 
<laughs> Wait, um, why did they want to? Why did they want to? Why were they mad about this? They were mad. I think it was part of like a larger Olympic protest because basically they shut down just tons of streets in Paris and people's movement was restricted. And I think my sense from talking to Parisians is that most of them like didn't really want the Olympics to be in the city. Um, they don't care about it. And uh, it actually hasn't been as much of a boon for like some of their industry as you, you would have thought. Um, so they were protesting the Olympics and they're like, okay, we're going to shit in the Seine. <laughs> and like, this is going to undo, <laughs> you know, the hundreds of millions of Euro, uh, investment that our politicians have poured into, to cleaning it. I don't think they ended up doing it, but you know, now all of these athletes, <laughs> just, yeah, it's, it sounds like someone did. It someone sounds might. like someone did. There's like, yeah, yeah. Sorry. What were you saying, Brandon? <sighs> I, I like I'm interested in like m water municipal sanitation now in a way like I remember I was living in Seattle a long time ago they literally drained a reservoir because some dumb 14 year old like pissed in it but this is like a huge reservoir and it was like what is like ha uh, presumably like birds fly over it and shit in it you know like what is the what's the level of shit that needs to be in a body of water before it's Gonna get you That's probably a lot. It was a lot of, but France has a lot of angry people. So yeah. the, the millions of Frenchmen just. That's like a super it, French thing. Just like the response to the opening ceremony, which was yeah. basically like, it is what it is. <laughs> people were mad. They're like, oh, well, it's like, well, if you're trying to reveal your cultural heritage to the world, I think they did a great job of it. Sorry, Sanj, I'm cutting you off. No, I was going to say, I mean, it is, a, it's a, it's actually a very complicated technical question because they have these specific, like how much you know, E. coli you're allowed to have for the water to be safe to swim in. Um, but I mean, it's just, they, they ran out of protein in the dining halls at one point because they're trying to do this like eco-friendly dining, um, sort of plant focused dining for these Olympians who obviously have huge, you know, protein and carb needs. Can you, that's um, like a, giving your cat a vegetarian diet. It's yeah. that's the level of discourse that we're on <laughs> where it's just like this, like self evidently retarded thing to, to even suggest. And, uh, I cannot believe that the other thing was no air conditioning. I believe was, the, was another controversy. Yeah. Air con I think it broke or something like that. Um, Oh, I, I thought it was just anti anti. They were like, you know, we don't do that in Europe. That's an American thing. I'm just making that. I, I read that. I'm, that's me projecting my own prejudices. There were things the like, I mean, they made, um, they made track athletes like walk an hour to get to their race at one point because they had, they like changed the policy halfway. I mean, this is like Olympic lore for people who care, but Shikari Richardson, an American track star had to walk. She like missed her warm up and ended up not doing as well in her races as she probably could have because um, they like switched up the logistics on her last minute. There have been tons of instances like this in the past few days. Um, so not the best look for the Olympic organizers. Well, no matter how bad it was for them, it was a little bit better than Vienna where a uh, massive Taylor Swift concert canceled because as the New York Times the New York Times, you really got to, with the New York Times, it's always a journey between the headline and then the facts revealed six paragraphs down, okay? And the New York Times headline is, I think, something along the lines of like teenagers implicated in, in bombing or something. Just two, two teens, uh, let me actually get the exact one for you. Two teenagers planned attacks on Taylor Swift's Vienna concerts, authorities say. The New York Times, many paragraphs down. The main suspect is a 19-year-old man, 19-year-old man, who was radicalized online and swore an oath of allegiance to the Islamic State, uh, Franz Roof. Okay, so w when I hear two teenagers planned an attack, <laughs> okay, two, two teenagers planned attack, I'm imagining like, I don't know, like like dumb teens being wild and crazy, maybe some eggs, like a flower sack of flour falls down from the from 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 the rafters and Taylor Swift gets messy. No, no, no. We're talking about a 19-year-old ISIS fighter is what we're talking about. We're talking about Islamic, we're talking about Islamic militants is what we're talking about. Um and that's Europe. Um now the question, the open question, I believe, is what is scarier, an ISIS militant at a Taylor Swift concert or 10,000 
furious Taylor Swift fans. And that's the question for you guys today. What do you think? <laughs> which, way, which way does this one go? I mean, just in my personal life, I'm, I'm more scared of the Taylor Swift army. <laughs> like they are aggressive online and I, I don't really see like ISIS people talking online. I guess they probably all get like censored, I would assume. But the Taylor Swift army is vicious. And <laughs> well, there probably aren't a lot of them also yet in America. That's the mm. thing that I would like to also keep that way. I don't know how we do that, but You're I would like go ahead. European teens love to join ISIS. Like they, this is a European <laughs> phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's not false. There's a stat somewhere that like more, um, this is like not PC at all, but more British Muslims joined, um, ISIS and one of the other kind of terrorist groups than, uh, the British army. Um, you've got like scores of French, Belgium, British, whatever teens who, who rushed off to Syria. Back are at these, ISIS's heyday. Are they these love teens it. in like in Muslim are these Muslim teens and Muslim families? I, these... Most are, but not all. Because the famously yeah. did, in, in are, Britain, though. didn't didn't you have that um Jihadi you John? had those gr the girls. Remember the mm. the girls who went over there and then they were like, Oh shit, we were just force married to a bunch of terrorists. Oops. <laughs> and everyone's like, You fucked around and found out. You're not coming home. But I think they got home. I uh, did they get home? Um, I don't know. What well, there's one very high profile case of this girl, Shamina Begum, who she's she's of Bengali. She's like Bengali Muslim who grew up in in uh, London. And she famously joined ISIS, famously gave an interview in like a full niqab in Syria, being like, Yeah, I'm glad I joined ISIS. And then she like three years later after ISIS sort of got <laughs> lost power, she was located in a refugee camp in Syria and was like, I want to come back to Britain. And there's been this kind of ongoing battle in the courts, but they just denied her last appeal. So she's, Oh, they denied not, her. So she's stuck her, yeah. over there. So she's, she's, Damn. uh, they removed her British citizenship. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess when you swear allegiance against your country and join a terrorist organization, there probably should be some kind of consequence, but I'm not British, so I'm going to leave that one up to them. I will say that it, this is like a way less glamorous version of American radicals in the 60s and 70s who were getting brainwashed, they would say, brainwashed, Patty Hearst famously, into these like really crazy domestic terrorist Marxist organizations, which I'm not into domestic terrorism. One, I'm not into Marxism. Two, I'm not into hippies, number three. However, somehow the combination of them, especially on movies, is like it's sort of like a Bonnie and Clyde thing for me where I'm like, you definitely need to be put in jail or something, but I, it's like smoking also. Like there's like a sexiness to it. And I will say that the full, is it the niqab wearing? Yeah. It's not as sexy. It's not giving Hollywood glamour for me. And I'm very <laughs> aesthetic, aesthetically motivated. So I'm against the Islamic terrorist um, Europeans. But Brandon, I know that you disagree on this. Uh <laughs> <laughs> why, would I, why would I disagree with that? <laughs> I'm totally with you on that. Yeah, man, you're up. Well, vacation's over, kids. Um, it's time to come back to America. And let's make sure that we never have the <laughs> crazy ass. I don't know what they're dealing with over there. With the, I mean, we're always going to have an idiot who wants us to swim in a, in a polluted river. And I, I think there's no getting around that in America. But I do think that we can live in a world where joining... Um, terrorist organizations uh like islamic sort of fascist organizations is not sexy and cool and i think we just got to do we got to meme our we got to meme our way there we got to give the kids something else to be excited about um we'll save that for another day folks it's been real see you on the internet goodbye <laughs>